Hi, welcome to Metro by T-Mobile. Hi, my dad is in serious need of an upgrade. Yeah, my phone's a fossil. He needs a new phone and a new network stat. Well, when he switches to Metro, he can get an amazing iPhone 7 with HD Retina display for just $99.99 after ID validation. Wow, $99.99? Bye-bye, fossil. Requires porting of eligible number not currently active on T-Mobile Network or active on Metro in past 90 days. With validation of ID, an independent database limit for per account slash household. 32 gigabyte model only. See store for details and terms and conditions. Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base joneswalker.com and by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas and by Orange Theory Fitness, delivering fitness results for a healthier world. From Commander's Palace Restaurant in the Garden District in New Orleans, we're out to lunch with Peter Raschuti. Peter Raschuti is Tulane University's A.B. Freeman School of Business professor and director of the award-winning Birkenrode Reports. It's business, New Orleans style. Hi, I'm Peter Raschuti. Welcome to Out to Lunch. When you ask people the secret to success in business, there are two schools of thought. On the one hand, you're given this advice. Pick one thing that you understand that you're good at and specialize in that. And then there's the other school of thought. It says that because all markets are unpredictable, the only way to be sure you'll succeed is diversify. So which path is the secret to success? Specialization or diversification? My guests on Out to Lunch today are, strangely, on both paths at the same time. They're specialists who are diversifying. Lewis Scott is the owner of a company called Tetonic Designs. The interesting thing about Tetonic Designs diversification is that it's a one-man company. Lewis is a master craftsman in wood, he designs and builds furniture, and he does architectural renovations and all kinds of carpentry. And Lewis is a master craftsman in steel. He makes things like wrought iron fences, metal awnings, and more. Lewis, welcome out to lunch. Hi, thank you for having me. David Fuselet is a contractor in his family business, Pearl Construction. They're a construction company that does rebuilds and renovations as well as new construction. Now here's the diversification. David has founded an allied company with partner Patrick Shane called Shane and Fuselet. Shane and Fuselet are a property development company. They buy properties to develop and contract Pearl Construction to do the development. David, welcome out to lunch. Thank you for having me. Lewis, there are advantages and disadvantages to running a one-man business, like your company, Teutonic Designs. The advantage is you get along great with the boss. Uh, the, the disadvantage is that you can only work on one project at a time. While you're working on a project, you can't really be looking for future work. And because there's a limit of what people will pay, even for beautifully crafted furniture or metalwork, there's still a limit to how successful you can be. That is, if your definition of success is growing your business and increasing your revenue. But if your definition of success is something other than growth and revenue, maybe like independence and artistic freedom, then that recalibrates the equation. Where do you come down on the definition of success for Teutonic Designs? Uh, I think it's a, a constant struggle because I always want to be more successful. But at the same time, I don't want to give up the quality by like, hiring more people and not being able there to uh, control the project. But yeah, for the most part, I definitely love being able to just be artistic and create whatever I want and then have the control to modify it as the project you know, proceeds. And uh, if you decide to grow and bring in some people, are there a lot of people with these skills in no, town? <laughs> no, it's pretty difficult. So that's an, another uh, reason that I'm a one-man band, so, so to say. Uh, I have a few friends and family that I'll bring up along board but it's hard to get them away from their their day-to-day -day jobs because if I only have like a one-off project I only need them for like a, a week or two whereas like then you know they need to pay their bills and they need, you know steady income constantly but yeah it's really hard to find really qualified people in this field do we have um, training courses in in town the only thing I mean the thing you hear about and it makes sense of course is all these new stem courses but what about for the trades I think like there's a few high schools that now offer you know like general uh, shop class and stuff but like when I was growing up here we didn't have shop class in our school at all and my senior year I uh, took a course at Delgado that was like kind furniture. of on your own yeah you? just like it was like concurrent enrollment you had to like apply for it you had like reduced amount of classes at uh, your high school and then you can go in the afternoon and take a course 
And I did that and like I fell in love with building stuff. And I don't know if, like what exactly offer today as far as that goes, but I know there's a few programs at a few different charter schools that do something similar. You know, I took shop in high school and the first half hour was just scary stories about previous students that had been maimed by the Oh equipment. yeah, I mean our so. our professor had a missing finger. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it was like legit like <laughs> He just cut it off to get the job. That was so great. Yeah. yeah. David, there's a huge difference between being a contractor and being a property developer. As a contractor, you're generally taking very minimal financial risk. Your biggest risk is not getting paid. Uh, things are quite different when you're a developer. You're investing money at the beginning of the project to buy the property and you're spending money all the way along developing the project. You're also dealing with city politics, permitting, neighborhood associations, and often investor relations. It's a much more stressful existence. The upside is you stand to make a lot more money than you could being simply the contractor. In your experience to date, as being both a contractor and a developer, is the added stress of developing property worth it? Um, I mean, you nailed it with all the challenges um, that I face, or that we face, but I'd say so, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like a long-term strategy and a short-term strategy. The construction being the short-term financial gain and then um, actually being a developer and owner in the project has long-term advantages of, you know, cash flow and then, you know, equity in the building. So, um, yeah, it's kind of, it's taking two different strategies and trying to, you know, maximize profit. And uh, sometimes capital is difficult to get for a property developer, are you at the stage where, um, let's see, first of all, are you bringing in new investors, other investors? Um, I mean, we have a pretty healthy list of, of uh, investors that have completed projects with us and then others that would like to do projects with us. Um, as we've gone along and, and you know, advanced our portfolio, uh, we've gained the trust of more and more people and friends of other investors are now wanting to jump in and it's kind of just, you know, expanding from from past projects. Now you've got a very sexy, interesting project in the Bywater. That's going to be a, is it a hotel? That's correct. It's a hotel, a rooftop bar, and a ground floor commercial spaces. With one of those scary pools that, that looks like you're going over the edge? That's, so it's an infinity edge pool along, that's that adjacent to the river, and what we're modeling the design off is this, uh, is this hotel in Singapore. That has these three different, uh, three different vertical structures that are all tied together by like this surfboard-looking uh, rooftop with, that has like a 250-foot-long infinity edge. This project won't have that same scale, but that is that is the model that we're, you know, basing our design off of. Now that property. <laughs> um, by the way, the, even, the only reason I even know about these pools is my doctor has travel and leisure in the, in the lobby. That's the only uh, reason I got that. But it's, if you, um, you, when you bought the property, I think originally it was going to be condos. That's right. And then, what? now talk about a difficult decision midstream. How, how did that happen? Uh, I mean, we just, we, 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 we took a pause and we started analyzing the market around town and just saw how many condo projects were you know blooming up and then also there was a condo project directly across the street from us that broke ground prior to us and so we kind of were afforded the opportunity to sit back and watch how those progressed and how those you know um, panned out and um, we kind of decided that it, we didn't we wanted to change course and and honestly I think we landed on a concept that's highest and best use for the project for the site. And then you even have different, I only know this from people I know that are trying to build in your area, is that um, you actually have seasonal restrictions, right, on what is it, the uh, putting the pilings in and such? That's correct, yeah, so um, right now the river's over 15 feet, so um, between 11 and 15 feet at the river gauge, you need special permission from the, the Army Corps to drive piles. Below 11, you can drive piles. Um, so we're probably not going to be able to drive piles until July, August, because we have like abnormally high river levels this year. So it's just each year, regardless, it's just a window. It's a window, and it can it can open and close within a matter of days too. So it's it's very very technical, and you got to have a very experienced contractor on board. So Adam Brawls prayer prayer. You know, there's like yeah. a lot of other calculations. Yeah. Lewis, if you 
um, the way your business is set up now, do you ever think of making it two different businesses? Yeah, I've actually had a good friend of mine tell me that I should split off the furniture making and the construction and kind of do two separate entities. Uh, I haven't done it yet. We that actually, would involve cutting you in half. <laughs> yeah, <one> problems, <laughs> but, but go on. Like multiplicity and uh, <laughs> just clone myself. But uh, we actually just uh, got a shop on General Taylor Street. So we'll be moving to that in the next few weeks. And that's going to display your furniture? No, it's going to be able to give me a spot where I can create the furniture. Like right now, we do not have a shop. So it's, everything is kind of built on site or at my uh, friend's storage facility in Hammond. So. And so do you get um, customers come up to you and tell you what they're looking for you to build? Or do you, do you build the furniture, I guess, it on all spec? De- it all depends. I have people who come and bring me like photos from Pinterest. And they're like, I want this. And I want it cheaper. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, you want it hand built. And right. you want like the same quality. <laughs> but like, I'm like, I can't produce that. So I have that that happens. And then people will give me like ideas of what they want. or, And so it, it all depends on, it's like a mixed bag. You know what I get a kick out of is... Um, you're, you're both really good ads for uh, poor guidance counselors because uh, you were, <laughs> let's see, was it was it Lewis that you were a geology major? Yeah, I am a major in that's, geology. Uh, that's helped. Never tell when Absolutely. you're drilling for oil underneath Not your furniture store. And, <laughs> and Dave, you were uh, uh, engineering? That's right. So uh, still a little bit of, in a field a little bit. It did. It was interesting. I got to study the science behind building and construction, but which is something we needed at the Hard Rock. Correct. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. An, an engineer with a conscience would have been good. <laughs> <laughs> and you come from a family of these folks. Your your dad graduated from law school and quit the law the next day. That's correct. That's yeah. A- <laughs> that was it. Was during Vietnam, and uh, oh yeah. Yeah. So he decided some- he would yeah. learn law, and then. As soon as law school was over, he went into construction the next day. Now, Lewis, earlier, um, were you doing some work for the film industry? Yeah, when I uh, after college, I moved back. My stepdad worked in film, and he got me a job, just like building movie sets. And so I worked on a, like American Horror Story, uh, Twelve Years a Slave, tons of things like that. And it's amazing, like the amount of stuff you build that takes months, and then it's in the movie for like three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's crazy, but I, I really enjoyed it, and I learned a lot. And it's it's you can't really transfer it over to like general construction and like day to day because everything we built was built to look good for about five minutes, <laughs> whereas everything now has got to like look good for like as long as possible. But no, I really enjoyed working in film. It was a lot of fun. Does that business still exist? It still exists. I think they took a few of the tax credits away, so it's not as booming as it was at one point. But, I mean, I live right by Second Line Studios, and there's trucks constantly, you know, working and filming. So We've had those trucks that we had Hollywood trucks on. Uh, yeah, the right on the start of that. So. Shop with Tool Street. And, and uh, David, I've seen some of your work, and I'm kind of curious, uh, that, um, that really cool place, I guess it's on Rampart, Effervescence, the champagne bar. When you do a project like that, how much of it is they're telling you what to do and how much of it is you coming up with the original designs? Uh, well, that one, uh, the owner of Effervescence, Crystal Hines, uh, she hired an interior designer, and, um, and so we were basically told this is what the design is and they nailed it it was a beautiful design um so that wasn't our specific project but on other projects uh we're doing a project two doors down from effervescence where we hired the interior designer and the architect and we're you know kind of directing the the flow of design and Lewis, you're a blacksmith and uh well not technically well i mean just and the last blacksmith here is was uh, with Jean Lafitte and uh, the French Quarter, and he actually sold his business and opened a bar. So I'm a uh, Yeah, I mean, that might concerned. happen with me as well. Might. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite bar in New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> Very dark. There's how it is. <laughs> Lewis, have you had your druthers? I mean, you've got these two different businesses. What gives you the most pleasure? I think, I was thinking about this actually earlier today because I thought this might be a question because I I constantly get like, what's your favorite thing to build? Like, what's your favorite piece of furniture? And I absolutely hate that question because like, I have no idea. That's why I gave it. It's like asking a chef, like, what's his favorite thing to cook? I was like, I don't think it really matters. But I really like building really simple things. Like, it's funny. uh, We renovated an office shop and it was just like one morning I woke up. I went to Home Depot. I like got all the material, all the material in my truck. I brought it to there and just like just started going to town and like framed up walls and it was like the most satisfying thing to do. It was like 
from just taking nothing and then just like creating something within a day. Now, as a one-man band, I've got to ask you, you, you can only take on so many projects and such. How do you decide about taking on a project? Now, for me, it would be, uh, what does the profit margin look like on this versus the other one? Or uh, may it lead to other, other business down the road? Is that what you look at? Or yeah, absolutely. Like, if it can lead to more business, I'll definitely take it on. But if it, it depends on, like, some people want certain things, and I'm like, oh, it's kind of out of my wheelhouse, and I don't feel comfortable doing that. So it, it, all, it all really depends. Um, a lot of projects, it depends on, like, if I really enjoy the work. So if it's depending on the diff- difficulty of the ironwork or the uh, woodwork, we'll just uh, do whatever we, you know, feels is the best. So making money and feeling good. Yeah, it's, thinking, it's, thinking it's, it's a together. little That's yin and yang of making money and enjoying what you're doing. Oh, that is great. You're listening to Out to Lunch. I'm Peter Raschuti. I'm talking with David Fuselet from the development company Shane and Fuselet and construction company Pearl Construction and Lewis Scott from the metal and woodwork company Teutonic Designs. We'll be right back after this very brief break. Mmm, fresh cracked egg, sausage, melty cheese, and a toasty English muffin. Uh, honey? I appreciate you repainting our living room, but you're so into your McDonald's sausage McMuffin with egg, you've also painted the sofa, and the fish tank, and the cat. (laughs) Teal does bring out Mr. Pickle's eyes. Right now, buy any size McCafe Premium Roast Coffee Sausage McMuffin with Egg or McChicken Biscuit and get one for a dollar. Price and participation may vary. Value for item of equal or lesser value. For a limited time. Hi, welcome to Metro by T-Mobile. Hi, my dad is in serious need of an upgrade. Yeah, my phone's a fossil. He needs a new phone and a new network stat. Well, when he switches to Metro, he can get an amazing iPhone 7 with HD Retina display for just $99.99 after ID validation. Wow, $99.99? Bye-bye, fossil. Requires porting of eligible number not currently active on T-Mobile Network or active on Metro in past 90 days. With validation of ID, an independent database limit for per account slash household. 32 gigabyte model only. See store for details and terms and conditions. You're listening to Out to Lunch. I'm Peter Raschuti. I'm talking with Lewis Scott, who's a woodworker and steelworker at his own company, Teutonic Designs, and David Fuselet. Now, he's a member of his family's contracting business, Pearl Construction, and co-owner of the property development company, Shane and Fuselet. Lewis and David, this is the part of the show we call another great idea. Uh, Maybe you've got a friend like this. Maybe who's got a great idea for you. They tell you about this job you should apply for, or that guy you should have a cup of coffee with, or a great investment opportunity you should jump on. Now, you can take this advice, and it turns out to be a disaster. You can dismiss this advice and miss out on something that might have turned out really great, or you can take your friend's advice, and it turns out to be the best thing that ever happened to you. Do you have an example in your life or career of a friend that had a great idea for you? Did you take their advice, and how did it turn out? Uh, David? I do. Um, Probably the most influential person that has ever, well, not the most influential person, but uh, this guy Wolfgang Feist. He came to UNO while I was studying engineering there, and he was a professor from Austria uh, that started the Passive House movement. Now, what is that? The Passive House movement is, um, it's, it's worldwide now, and it's in Europe, it's like the industry standard for uh, green building design. Um, so, I mean, he's giving talks in Brussels and Berlin and all over the, all over the globe. Um, but he happened to be in New Orleans visiting the Make It Right Foundation that was, at the time, the largest green development in the world. Um, and he gave a speech at UNO, and I was just, like, blown away by this guy. It was, like, the most interesting thing I, I'd ever encountered. And afterwards, I was talking to him. He's like, well, why don't you just come to Austria and study with me? And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think that was a possibility. And, like, ended up so, uh, a lady, uh, Aaliyah Cott at, UN, at UNO, made it possible, and I applied for this scholarship, got it, and got to go live in Austria for a year and study with this brilliant brilliant man it was it was awesome wow what a good a good example of showing up for those lectures yeah that's yeah. Uh, they, uh, yeah lewis what about yourself do you have a similar situation i don't have a similar situation but i'm thinking about this question and i think you touched upon it earlier when you said about guidance counselor when i was in high school my guidance counselor was dead set on me going to college i remember when we uh i signed up for the concurrent enrollment class she's like well what is 
constru- uh, what does building furniture have anything to do with like all the science that you're excelling in like on the on, on all your test scores and I was like nothing I just really enjoy it and she was like well maybe you should just do something like construction management and like not to take this course and I decided to take the course anyway because it was something like I was really interested in like having to take and uh I don't know she just definitely pushed me to not do that and definitely like kind of wanted to put me on a track to just go to college and I don't think that's necessarily like the best thing for like a lot of people out there I mean I went to college I absolutely loved it and I enjoyed it and I appreciate everything that I learned but a lot of people out there think like the the road to success is a college degree and it's not necessarily like the point like I have a degree in geology but I literally use it like never and so (laughs) I was like did I waste a lot of money maybe but like I you know gained some friendships and some networks that you know helped me along the way but just a lot of people out there who might be listening and you know you don't necessarily need to go to college to be successful and this is not an anti-guidance counselor show. There's, a, there's just how you get letters. They were great. I'm not blaming her. It wasn't yeah. her fault. And what was her name again? Can you help us with the... Uh... <laughs> and, uh, you know, David, I've got to... <laughs> the Bywater... You know, I once saw a bumper sticker that said, the Bywater, a work in progress since like 1850 or such. Um, is this for real now? Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, what made us, like feel very confident in the change of use from condos to hotel was some articles that we saw online about Bywater ranking at the top of a lot of lists for, you know, unique boutique neighborhoods worldwide to visit and travel to. And you're not far from, like, not far from NOCA, right? Exactly. So we're, I mean, a two-minute walk from NOCA. And we're actually forming a partnership with NOCA. In what way? So we have a couple mural walls, like four-story tall mural walls, that we're going to com- be commissioning through NOCA. Uh, we're purchasing all of our artwork in all of the hotel rooms through NOCA students. Uh, the, the lobby is going to be a NOCA-inspired gallery. Um, and then in the hotel rooms, we'll have uh, musical playlists by NOCA uh, alums, uh, we'll offer literature in the lobby and rooms for by NOCA alums. So it's going to be a very NOCA-centric uh, hotel, and we're trying to tie the two campuses together like in, 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 through Crescent Park as well, make it kind of an art walk um, and bring it, bring it full circle. Now, how did that come about? Did you approach them? or? Um, honestly, like we were trying to figure out how we can make strategic partnerships in the neighborhood. And, um, uh, I mean, they're the biggest player in the neighborhood and, um, Do anything with Mr. Bob, <laughs> that's, uh, that's well, right near there. Right? Yeah. So yeah, I did actually reach out to Mr. Bob about, um, doing a mural for us as well. And, um, he, he sounded interested as well. Um, but we kind of wanted to go with NOCA, them being, you know, students and, you know, providing a lot of business and opportunities for them. Um, so that seemed like a good, a good source. And then there's a couple other groups in, in, in the neighborhood that we're looking to partner up with as well, like the farmer's market, the arts market. Uh, we're looking to bring them on site. Now, I see where you made the decision to make it a boutique hotel. How many rooms are going to be in there? It's, uh, it's like an Airbnb-style hotel, so it's 18 suites um, ranging from four to three bedrooms per suite. Uh, so it's a total of 62 bedrooms. And business success is, is a lot of it is pricing. Uh, Lewis, how do you price your, your piece? You know, obviously, that was a funny story about people coming with a Pinterest photo, but how do that, you do it? That's literally the hardest part of my job is figuring out how much it's worth. Like, I've, obviously, I can do a cost analysis and how much time I put into it and the materials. But then there's also it, there's an artistic part that I'm still trying to, like, struggle with. Like, like how beautiful is this towards, like, to what the customer is satisfied with? And so it's it's definitely the most difficult, and I feel like maybe I under under underball it. I don't know. I'm not really sure, but it's definitely the the hardest part is what is it what is it worth? You kind of um, I guess over time you probably begin to get a better feel. Yeah, you definitely get. It's just like estimating for a job. Like at first you're like I don't know how much all this is going to cost or how long it's going to take me. But then as, the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it. And David, you have the same situation. You're located in a very unique. Uh, part of part of the city and such how do you decide where you're going to price those rooms well we're actually um we're going to be leasing out the hotel operation to another to a third party so um we're not going to be responsible for running the hotel so let's see i, I guess that's what i, I need explained right you're you're 
you're the developer, the owner, along with your partners and such, but once it's complete, are you going to continue to own it or and you're just going to farm out the hotel management to correct so we're leasing out basically we have a master lease on all 18 suites to a company that specializes in uh, airbnb rentals and they're going to be managing and operating the hotel and just paying us a rent now you in that situation where you maybe need to sell properties to get the capital back to try something else or uh, in terms of is there enough capital around where you wouldn't have to necessarily sell the hotel to get uh, the cash out to take on another project. Yeah, uh, I mean, we're definitely going to not sell this hotel. Um, and in, in terms of raising capital for future projects, um, we'll just get more investors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's like Yeah. I know you have a sandwich board out in front of your commanders, and I <laughs> I, I love the park along the river. What, what does it mean to where your success? Oh, I mean, it was huge. It was a $32.5 million um, park installation that went right there. And, uh, I mean, there's that was only the first phase. Um, so it beautified that area tremendously um, and made it very walkable, very attractive, and... Um, and we're gonna we're gonna be right at the entrance to that ho- uh, to that park, uh, so um, we're gonna really activate that Rusty Rainbow Bridge and that corridor. And, um, I think it's gonna be really special. That's what it's called, the Rusty Rainbow. Rusty Rainbow it was designed by David Adjay, who was the architect who designed the at- the African American Museum in D.C. So I mean, pretty like substantial piece of art that got built right there. Have you guys ever worked together, by the way? Who? You two? No. No. But I'm thinking we should. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the goal of this show, by the way. Yeah. Is the, uh, we'll have to. I'm only here for the networking yeah. and the free and food. The free lunch, right? <laughs> uh, David, in terms of uh, the two different companies, I assume you're hiring Pearl Construction to do the, the work. I guess you've heard good things about them. We, we're, uh, we're doing, so we're doing a, um, a couple similar style projects uh, to the hotel in the Bywater and the CBD. Um, Are these be Camp other St- hotels? Yes, on Camp Street and Barone, and we will be performing the construction on those projects, and they range from 7,000 square feet to, I think the largest is 12,000 square feet. The project on the river, uh, we actually hired F.H. Myers to come in and, and be the, the prime contractor for that project, just because it's a little bit out of our scale. You mentioned earlier that you thought there might be, a lot of people are talking about, maybe this glut of condos, uh, at some point here, but there's also quite a few hotels. What were you thinking about when you when you did the background there? So I saw an article um, online that was produced uh, talking about um, the demand and, and lack of supply for hotels in the city and how we're only able to attract a certain tier of convention because we don't actually have enough supply to get the really big convention um, here in New Orleans. They go to Las Vegas and Miami and all that. So there's actually a push and a need for a few thousand more hotel rooms and keys in the city. So um, right now, the curve is going up. We're we're not going to see the plateau for a while. Um, And then how did you decide what kind of hotel it would be? You didn't decide to do a convention hotel or anything like that? I think the modern traveler um, focuses more on the economics of you know staying in a Airbnb as opposed to like a one bedroom hotel room that might cost three hundred dollars a night for a one bedroom hotel as opposed to splitting that cost with you know six people three hundred dollars in a three bedroom. It's in um, so I think the demand is going to keep going more and more in that direction. And actually, uh, Marriott is starting to develop. Airbnb style hotels and they actually tried to purchase this company Sonder which is the company that we're working with um, they turned down the offer but uh, I think the hotel industry is pushing towards this Airbnb style so some smart people mm-hmm. yeah. that are going yeah. to this end mm-hmm. listen I was reading the, the research on you one of the things you said was that your dad mandated that you get a degree that was going to be useful and yeah. uh, real how did um, how's it going with the family? That's what I wanted to know. <laughs> I think he expected me to be a doctor, 
Oh, but, well. Yeah, that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> but my, my sister turned out having a PhD, so I think that that was good enough for him. But uh, no, he just wants me to be happy. Like, I don't, you know, I've actually hired him on a few jobs. And it's funny to have that like reverse role where I'm the boss and I can be like, all right, come on, dad, pick it up. I mean, he's like, <laughs> obviously <laughs> he's like in his like 60s now. And so it's like he's <laughs> way slower, but he's like an incredible worker. He can do anything and he's willing to work hard. So. But it's just funny to have them in that role. So don't necessarily go to college and yeah, don't go to college and, and like, get to a point where you can boss your dad. Yeah, hire this your dad. Is, hire your dad. dad. Yeah. <laughs> what an unusual you show, really. There's a <laughs> <laughs> people often use the phrase "living the dream." Ironically, it's mostly a sarcastic response to the question, "How's it going?" When things obviously aren't going well. But there are few people among us who really are managing to carve out a dream professional life for themselves, doing what they love, and making a living doing it. And Lewis and David, you both fit in that enviable demographic. You're managing to follow your passions, do good work, and keep the lights on. Congratulations on everything you're achieving. I look forward to keeping up with you and following your continued success. Thank you both for taking the time to join me today on Out to Lunch. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You very much. My guests on Out to Lunch today have been Lewis Scott, owner of Teutonic Designs, and David Fusilet. He's the contractor at Pearl Construction and the co-owner of Shane and Fusilet. If you want to know what we look like, you can find photos from this show on itsneworleans.com and on our Out to Lunch social media. These photos were taken today by Jill LaFleur. You can find more of Jill's photos at LaFleurphoto.com. Out to Lunch is a production of INO Broadcasting for itsneworleans.com and WWNO 89.9 FM. The producer of our show is Grant Morris. Our technical producer is Eric Merle. And our researcher is Maggie Mendel. I'm Peter Raschuti. Thanks for joining me. I look forward to meeting you again next week around the table here at Commander's Palace for more business. New Orleans style on Out to Lunch. Out to Lunch is recorded live over lunch at Commander's Palace in New Orleans. Commander's Palace serves lunch Monday to Friday, jazz brunch on Saturday and Sunday with live music, and dinner seven nights a week. Mitchell Foreman wrote and performs all the music on Out to Lunch. You can hear Mitchell's music anywhere great jazz is sold or streamed and at MitchellForeman.com. Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base. JonesWalker.com. And by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas. And by Basics Swim and Gym and Basics Underneath Fine Lingerie, the It's New Orleans Happy Hour podcast. And by Orange Theory Fitness, delivering fitness results for a healthier world. Celebrate the big 2020 with T Mobile. Switch now and get two lines for just 90 bucks and two new iPhone 11s on us. So you can take a portrait built for two with the ultra wide camera. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, cute. Hurry in to T Mobile and get two lines for 90 bucks and two iPhone 11s on us with qualifying trade ins. Via 24 credits for well qualified buyers with auto pay plus taxes and fees. If you cancel before receiving 24 credits, you may owe up to the full value of your device of $699.99. Contact us. Qualifying port ins and finance agreements required.